Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Bart Bettig. I'm the executive director of the National Tile Contractors Association. Just happy to have you here in Las Vegas. We've been enjoying several days of, uh, of a, a, a great event. Uh, we're just delighted to be back together again. Reminder that our courses are AIA and IDCEC accredited. You can get the forms in the back of the room. Uh, this is called NTCA Roundtable Live. And as you can see, we're not at a round table, but you guys all have round tables. But anyways, during COVID and that, we've had a lot of what we would call Zoom or virtual roundtable conversations. And we found it to be really valuable uh, to get everyone together. So uh, what I, we have some just excellent uh, five-star contractor guests of ours at the NTCA, They're just a wealth of information. Uh, and I'm really going to just kind of uh, go along uh, and uh, kind of grill them with some different questions, some things that have come to my mind that I think are important. But I also would like to tell you all, we're just happy to have you, and this is a roundtable. So if you uh, have a comment, if we're on a slide that, that maybe you have a question on or you might want to make a comment, just raise your hand. I'll be looking, uh, and, uh, and we'll get you involved and engaged because that's what this is all about. So I'd like to just introduce my panelists. They're not in order, but I'm just going to go down on the end with Erin uh, and just have her just introduce herself to you and tell you a little bit about her business real quickly, and we'll get to our questions. So thank you. Hi, I'm Erin Albrecht, uh, owner of JNR Tile in San Antonio, Texas. We do commercial and a bit of high-end residential, five-star contractor. Martin? Uh, Martin Brooks, Mill Valley, California, high-end residential contractor, five-star contractor, and uh, currently president of NTCA. Dirk Sullivan, Portland, Oregon. Uh, we do primarily high-end uh, residential, mostly remodel, a little bit of new construction, but not as much as the remodel market, and um, to a five-star contractor. Um, I'm Woody Sanders. I'm with D.W. Sanders Tile and Stone Contracting out of Atlanta, Georgia. We are in the residential luxury market, and uh, we do take pedestal projects into the commercial market. Uh, my name is Dan Lambert. I'm with Lambert Tile and Stone out of the Vail Valley in Colorado. Um, we primarily uh, are in high-end custom residential home. We do a little bit of light commercial, um, quite a bit of exterior work. My name is John Cox. I'm from San Antonio, Cox Tile. Um, our main, uh, really, our focus is, is high-end residential. We try to do the hardest, the most difficult, challenging jobs. That's our, that's our forte in, in trying to build our, or maintain our name. And as I said, uh, I'm Bart Bettiga. I've been uh, with the National <coughs> Tile Contractors Association for 20 years. Uh, we, the NTCA is one of the five uh, owning associations in this show covering. So if you don't know about us or you want to uh, come uh, learn a little bit more information about us, come to see us in our booth. Every one of our, of my, of our guests here are uh, NTCA members. They're actually, uh, their companies have all been <coughs> recognized in, in a company recognition program that we call as the Five Star Contracting, uh, five, five Star Contractor Program. We have about 65 of those companies around the country. And uh, these are, it, in various capacities, every one of my guests have been very highly involved in our association, either through uh, our board of directors, our technical committee, giving presentations, uh, or uh, even on our executive committee, several of them. So I'm, I'm, we're going to kind of wing this as a roundtable. Uh, and this is, you know, really uh, just, uh, you know, there's so many business changes going on, just, so, you know, so many, abs you know, different uh, things happening right now from, uh, you know, getting material, changing prices. Uh, uh, as you all know, the situation in the Ukraine has created just absolute havoc uh, in uh, tile production in Europe and in getting those products here. So as contracting companies, these are not necessarily companies that are uh, importing, you know, multiple com containers at a time, but they're still being impacted. So I'm going to just kind of look at Aaron and start, but, you know, just, you know, what's your number one concern you know, going on in your business today. I know things are going well for you, Aaron. Uh, um, but, you know, what do you, you know, basically how has it changed? And maybe what, you know, just kind of reading the tea leaves, what do you think it might be a year from now? I think biggest challenge today is just what you said, logistics. And, you know, getting certain materials on time. 
we was I, I was just talking to uh, Martin a, a bit ago. We we just want a large commercial project, and the biggest concern is can we get the material here on time um, from that first start date, and if that contract if we get a, a notice to proceed and the contract isn't given before a certain date, is that material pricing going to stick? Are we going to have to run through the whole process again? You know, what material are we using? Because it, it is one of these containers having to come in um, if it's not made stateside. So really trying to locate materials and get them into projects commercially, and I, I assume residentially would be the same issues um, for everybody, but really getting getting those in and secured and, and are bonded and you know in our warehouse and making sure that we can meet project deadlines we're always accelerated toward the end of a project especially commercially uh, it's just it's everybody else is behind and it's failed at the beginning of the project and then we are we're accelerated and, and com our schedules are compressed so the last thing we need is any sort of risk when it comes to materials that should be the one thing that we don't have to worry about right we have way too much to worry about with the manpower and scheduling and then have to having to add materials on that is is really a concern and i think with the situation going on abroad it's going to continue to be a concern a year from now yeah. any anything to add to that any of you i mean i'm, I'm just thinking earlier meetings conversations open transparency with your supply chain well, I think we have to be very agile right now. Price escalation is certainly a concern for everyone. Uh, some of my projects, uh, I bid 18 months out, and uh, having that conversation with the owner and the, and the GC about price escalation uh, sometimes falls on deaf ears. But you know, I try to have that conversation and, and uh, through documentation and keep people very aware of what's going on in, in the world out there. Dirk, what do you what, what do you find? You're mo what you'd be most concerned about right now going on in your business? Uh, exactly the same thing. Uh, procuring uh, material, especially material that's coming from Italy or Spain. Um, we're bidding jobs right now where, um, like Martin said, there be 12 to 18 months before we're getting the job. And um, sure, there's stock now, um, but I guess the, the biggest problem is is what is that price going to look like? I mean, seriously, it, by the time we have a down payment and we can actually order the material, what does that price look like? And how do we communicate that? And how do we, how do we, on the jobs we're, we're now, you know, from this day on, we're going to be estimating, how do we communicate that? Um, I think that, it, I think we really need to lean on the domestic producers and we need to educate the, um, a, you know, architects, designers, our builders, our, our homeowner clients that you know we need to be very cautious about where we're getting our material and I, like I said you know I'm not gonna name names but we have plenty of very good quality domestic producers here that we need to lean on and, and even I have a small fleet of trucks and I've just added fifteen thousand dollars a year in gas prices to my small fleet of trucks so oh, there's that too I'm, yeah I'm glad you we add them to every bid now we yeah. have to yeah I mean so you're, you're being impacted not only by changing prices on the material side that you can't control, but your costs, right? Your specific costs are being impacted. What do you? What are? Are you having meetings with your builders? I mean, are you alerting your builders, or are they just being hit by pri by prices all over on every category, so they're already aware of this? What kind of meetings are those taking place? I'd, I'd like to say, my, my people hear it too much. We're disjointed, right? Right now, um, we're we're. I think all of us here, our success is our, our ability to be very proactive. We're always engaging, having conversations, probably to nauseam in some cases, and, and that to keep everybody aware. And, and, it, and, and in their in their world, just, or, or in the same world we are, they're managing 50 subs. They're they're being pushed in a lot of directions, and it's it, and, and you're trying to politely yell at them. To get their attention that you need to pay attention to this it, it you know in, in the luxury market or in the high-end market uh, th there's we're mocking up we're doing things that's just part of our, our skill set and what we're doing and and we we're literally have been saying i you don't understand you've got to make this decision today i can't afford you not to make this decision you've got so we're, we're having it's not just the conversation to price it's, it's You've got to be more flexible than you have in the past. Because you need more lead time to get the material and make the planning? Or we, can we even get it? 
right? Can we even get in the other thing is, is the, the prices, like we've got a huge project, we're having to pull the material out of Italy. Um, it's very specialized material as we all deal with, cut to size. Um, we can't even give you freight until the day the PO goes through. And that, and, but the price we're giving today is probably not even good today, right? And then so you're having to say, if you don't understand, then we just don't need to engage here because we can't guarantee what we're being quoted. If you don't order today, we give you the quote. The quote's no good in that, as far as materials are concerned. Now, I'm a little different. Um, we are very transparent. We aren't trying to procure materials and make markup. We, we do that differently in our estimating process. Um, and therefore, it, it probably helps them be a little more palatable in some ways. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's, it, I, I, you've just got to say, you know, in one way we need to speed up, and another way we need to slow them down think through what we're all dealing with. And, and generally when you can get them into the rationale, you see the same world I do, you see the same things I'm seeing right now, this is affecting us all. So uh, Dan, I, I think I remember seeing that Elizabeth was lo looking for work. I mean, so you still, you're in Colorado Spring or Colorado Springs or Colorado, right? Uh, yeah, we're, but, you we're know, is it hard to Vail find, Valley, is Eagle, labor Colorado, availability yeah. still an issue for you? Oh, absolutely, yeah, labor's definitely been a challenge. Fortunately, while we've been at the show here, we've had a couple more inquiries and, you know, it's looking better. Um, got some more labor, labor secured with some uh, subcontract labor that's worked for us for years. Subcontract labor, so you're looking for skilled people. Yeah, we primarily hire employees and train, um, but we do have a handful of uh, subcontract labor as well. Has anybody been, you know, I haven't gone to you, John, yet, but has anybody been struggling getting material prior to what's happened in Ukraine? I mean, this has been going on, so what do you think is going to happen now that we know what's going on in Ukraine if this situation doesn't ease soon, knowing that, you know, in particular, the two largest uh, exporters of tile to the U.S. are Italy and Spain. And in Italy and Spain, you know, both of those countries have been, you know, highly reliant upon uh, clay from the Ukraine, believe it or not, uh, and also uh, gas, uh, uh, natural gas from Russia. And their costs are, from what I've heard, 400 uh, percent high, uh, up 400 percent, you know, with what's going on there. So what concerns do we have about Italian and Spanish material moving forward. We we don't we fortunately have not had a big issue with with supply chain, other than some of the domestic um, manufacturers not having the manpower to to produce it like they have in the past. That's one of our our big uh, problems. The good thing is we don't rely on a lot of uh, materials from from Italy and and really the Spain European. We're 150 miles from the border of Mexico, and so a lot of the stone that we use uh, is is from Mexico, and you know it's good good material, but you know that hasn't uh, thank goodness it hasn't slowed slowed down yet um, on trying to procure it. You know one of the one of the bottlenecks is as these as everyone in this room knows is personnel. You know we're trying to you can only train a person so fast. And trying to get, uh, you know, we don't subcontract anything. We'll not subcontract. So everybody that works for us is an employee. So, you know, you're, you're trying to, to not, not only mold them to our cor corporate co culture of uh, how we operate, because we I very, very can be very difficult to work with because of, of what we represent to, to our customer. So, you know, it's, it's uh, that's a challenge with, with trying to, I call it reprogramming. I don't call it re, you know, retraining. I call it reprogramming, where I'm trying to get them to that point. And we're reaching out. Cody, uh, my son, is reaching out to some of the high schools for for some of our future labor. And we've been very successful with with uh, with with that avenue of going and, and speaking. Um, also, some of the they have job fairs, and and actually we're gonna, we're going to really. Uh, concentrate on some of the schools with the seventh and eighth graders of trying to to develop you know some interest where later on when they have when they get into high school that they have um, some path and what we what we do is we actually take a scroll saw and let them play cutting like puzzles you know that way they've got something instead of doing something straight where they 
you know, it, it looks boring. There's nothing glamorous about it. But if you take a piece, you, you say a white and a purple, you glue them together, they use a scroll saw. It's something they can go home and show their parents and say, look what I made. And so, you know, we're, we're just trying to use that to, to uh, help the interest level. Woody, something came to me before uh, when you were finishing. You talked about they should select now. Are there any conversations on alternative selections? Like if this we can't get this, is there a second choice or a third choice? Or do you just have to get it? And, or, and how, how much more are we as contractors, maybe you all can maybe uh, having to value engineer, uh, knowing that maybe you might want to look at a domestic supply or something you can rely on, uh, maybe more, you know, more from uh, you know, domestically because you know they have the inventory? No, <laughs> not, in my, not, not, not in our, not, I think I would, I would say, yeah, we, all, we, uh, that. we, it just doesn't work that our clients want what they want. They aren't limited by budget. Um, so it just becomes a lot of pressure for us to get it done. Um, you, changing that is very difficult. Is it's not going to happen because, because our, and, and you know, the, the project may be in Atlanta but the design team's probably out of New York or San Francisco, and so we're, 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 we just have those challenges. I think the, the design community obviously understands. So value engineering is not a big component of your business? Won't happen at all. Dirk or Dan? Yeah, yeah we, we do. We've, we've run into this a bit in the past year, um, especially. Um, so what we do with our clients is if we see that there's a long lead time item and that's not going to fit within the, the schedule, then we um, promote an alternate um, the other thing that we do is we'll have prices guaranteed for up to 30 days, um, but we let our clients know that um, what we would like to do to be able to procure the material, make sure that we're not waiting on the material in the future, is to get that material deposit up front and then order the material, procure the material, and then that's one less thing that we have to worry so about. You'll have, it, you'll have it at your warehouse longer, maybe, because you're going to order it earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I think what we're doing is is is... I think the communication becomes, is this it? Where, where, where there, you know, I always would say, we don't know the last tile we're putting in until we put it in. And that now we're saying, we've got to know this tile today. And then we're, my warehouse is full of tile right now, you know, for jobs I want, for that I, you know, I'm running out, of, I'm having to put addition on because we're, you know, we're literally running out of space because we're, 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 we're keeping tile that on a job we won't see until next year. Right yeah, but now. you'll sleep easier. Dirt, go ahead. We're in exactly the same boat. We're actually ordering a shipping container and having it brought in because we need alternative space. Really? Luckily, we have enough room in our yard for that in our parking lot. Um, but yeah, we have more tile for jobs we're not even doing for six months in my warehouse right now. And because I've been adamant with all of our contractors and all of our homeowners and all of our designers that we order ASAP because I guarantee we won't be able to get it and get it at the price that we want to get it at. So as quickly as we can get a down payment, we're ordering your material. We're living in unique times. Aaron, I've been talking about tile. What about installation materials? Are we having trouble getting all of the supplies we need on the installation material side? And how important is your relationship with your installation material supplier so that you're having these kinds of conversations? Locally, we haven't really had an issue with installation materials. I, I think that a big part of that is the relationship that we have with the material suppliers that, that we use and the distributors that, that give them. As long as we give them a heads up and they come to us, they're very proactive. We're lucky that they ask, hey, what do you need us to stock? Or what do you need on our shelves that you can come in often and, and get? And I think that's been a really big help. Plus we stock all of our own adhesives and waterproofing material and uh, backer board and pallets at a time. So we're lucky to have that room in the warehouse and that keeps us going on uh, smaller commercial projects as well as smaller commercial and smaller, um, well, really our residential projects. And we're, I'm probably the only one in this group that does value engineer back to that last question commercially on I think every it's, project. It, and you know, it is normally a part of a commercial project. Sometimes it's just necessary, right? Well, and we do a lot of value engineering as well too. Um, and almost always whenever I see a specification come across um, on a set of plans that if I know right away that I, there's a material I'm actually going to be able to get quicker and actually a little bit more cost effectively, I always present. I always present it. I think um, we're responsible too. This week, th this last few weeks, um, I've had jobs that we were estimating um, in January. The job has been sold. I've gone and put POs in for material that was in stock and now it's been discontinued. 
and I had to do this on two different occasions. Um, I'm not going to say who the manufacturer or who the distributors were, but uh, we had to cross things over, and I, we were scrambling like crazy to cross things over, and then sending change orders for the price increases on those changes. I, I would add that there's never been a more important time to double check your quantities right now because when you Hallelujah. when you're that far out, you may not be able to get that material. Uh, you're talking about running short on a job, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Well, we we've been buying bulk um, thin sets, metal lath. Instead of waiting to, to react on what we, we do, we've been trying to, to buy because, you know, with the cost escalation, you know, if we're trying to lock that in, so that's not a big factor in trying to, to raise our prices. Um, you know, just buying, buying a, a bulk, whether it sits there, we've got the room to put it. And that way it doesn't affect, you know, the, the price later on. That's a, that's a key to what we're trying to provide. Do any of you, I mean, we're living in a world of inflation. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, your costs are going up. You know, consumers or builders, a builder probably understands this, but a consumer doesn't always understand that, you know, the cost of your, your, your trucks and the gas and all of that. Are any of you concerned with price, your, you know, our pricing, tile installation pricing, tile material pricing, and losing any of that business to competitive products? No, I, I, I feel like everyone's in the same boat. Whether I, unless you're going to price yourself out of business, I'm not so sure whether there's an al alternate right now to what we're doing. I mean, at this level with these people, my colleagues here on the floor, I mean, we provide such a quality, unique product that it's like, where are you going to go? I mean, my clientele use Heritage Marble and Tile based on the product that we turn out, and I'm not so sure whether my general contractors are willing to value engineer or go somewhere else at this point. What what I'm more concerned with is is, is the guys that aren't educated because it, what the the gap becomes much larger and so it's sometimes more difficult to sell the value of what you're doing when somebody says, well, he he's five dollars a square foot lower than you, and you know trying to trying to justify what you're doing and why you're doing. So that's that's a challenge to itself. You know, on, on jobs, and and the builders understand it. But when you're doing with a dealing with an individual homeowner, that becomes more of a challenge. And you know, we just have to say, this is our price. Uh, if you need to find another source, we understand. But it's like deja vu. It's like the Great Recession created that atmosphere too. With I had two of my top builders go somewhere else, but they came back quickly because they couldn't produce the same the same product, right? The same product, or the installation wasn't as good. Well, the installation wasn't because the end product didn't uh, match what the criteria was for a high-end residential home. Yep. And so the they just and, came back. And the service that, that we provide from the beginning to the end and through the, uh, through the life of the project. I remember looking at a job a couple of weeks ago, and the guy says, you're, you're, you're two and a half times higher than the, another person. I said, I, I, but, and then he got mad at me, right? He, he was mad at me in this conversation. I go... And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you want what I provide, you just don't want to pay for it, you know. And, and you, it, I have to just kind of let that go. And let well, that leads me to, uh, you know, in busy, busy times, you've all, we're, the, the, tile, the tile market's pretty good, I think, for the type of work that your companies provide. What, what, what's your process uh, or how do you uh, work with your team on pre-qualifying your customers. I mean, you're not, you're not just going to take any, the you know, next job to fill a schedule. Are you, are you cultivating specific builders or specific general contractors? I, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that pre -qual You know, not just doing work for anybody, but doing work for people that value you and trust you and uh, respect the work that you provide. We, ha we have questions that we ask when somebody calls. We have questions to really try to vet them to find out what they're looking for and if, we're just, if they're tire kickers. So, you know, we ask, you know, we have five or six questions that we ask before we'll even say, hey, we'll, we'll come out and give you a, a, a guesstimate of what it's going to be. Um, it's, but that's, builders, we had two builders that went away a couple of years ago, and they've come back because of the people that they hired did, did a crummy job. And, you know, yes, we were more expensive, and they, they realized the value, and so it, it's made it, you know, somewhat easier, but, but now's an opportunity. I mean, you know, the things are good, and we've got to take advantage of the opportunity that, that we have. Not to gouge people, but make the op take the opportunity, because, again, prices, um, you know, are going through the roof for, for everyone. And so, you know, you've, you've got to make a profit. 
You know, that's Michael Stone, his book, Markup and Profit. If you guys have never read it, it's one of the best books I promoted. I tell people, you know, I don't, I don't get anything in return. I tell people to buy it because if it's not the best book you've ever written on business, I'll buy it back from you. That's how, how I believe in it. But, you know, people, people need to know that they have to make a profit in order to stay in business. Uh, that's actually, uh, I, I'd like to actually hear from others on, about, on, on how they qualify their customers. But it is, a, it is an important point you make, which is, you know, if you've never understood your costs, uh, uh, you know, and you're just bidding work uh, and, you know, think you're making money, I think now's the time to uh, really definitely understand your costs and understand if you're making profit or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we look at a job, we're looking at it not just as far as, you know, do we need to be competitive with it, but what do we need to make as far as our profit margins? And uh, we look at things based off of time because the majority of our work is done by employees. Um, so we can gauge that easier and knowing somebody's efficiency with a certain product or, a, you know, skill set using that person um, for that uh, project. Um, you know, as far as vetting our, our clients, um, that's kind of been a, a process and, and uh, an experience over years of just building relationships with people and um, being there to answer their questions. If they have a, you know, something that, you know, they sell the home down the road, you know, they pass our name along um, and just keeping the service for people. And I think that that helps to um, create an atmosphere where they know that they're getting the best uh, value and you know there's always cost and value and somebody's price up front might be a lot you know might be substantially lower than than your price but if you're providing a better quality product then that's going to be the best value down the road yeah, especially especially if it if it succeeds and doesn't fail Woody did you have a, a comment you wanted to make about I, I, it yeah I think um, two things I, I think you know I always said this I was a tradesman who became a contractor I'm a contractor who's become a businessman they all had different aspects. They have different problems and different. I don't physically work. I, phys, I don't physically work with my hands every day. I have other, but I mentally work and carry the weight. Um, one, I'm never embarrassed to say I don't know. That, that, I think that's the biggest thing. And, and I think any good tradesman has an ego. I don't think you can be a good trades without a certain amount of ego. And that. Um, but but I'm not, so I so I, I'm a big proponent of hiring consultants, fi finding those people, talking to other people, and find those people who know a lot more than I do, and helping me develop things. So we've hired firms that are really have helped us understand deeper dives, indirect direct costs, uh, where our margins need to be, where we're at. We and then I wanted because John and I've talked about this a lot. I can intuitively do that, but the people I'm grooming behind me can't. That's great. That's an interesting component. What about your employees? Some uh, on your business models, most of you, I think, actually have employees and not subcon subcontractors. So some may do sub subcontracting. Uh, talk a little bit about what type of employee. Uh, are you, I'll, I'll go to you, Dirk, first. Uh, you know, are you looking for somebody that's been out installing tile for 10 years, uh, maybe, uh, or are you looking to get somebody you know relatively new coming right out of? high school and then you can train them into the Hawthorne tile uh, mindset. What are your, what's your thought process on, what's the ideal type of employee that you recruit in to your company? Yes. Yeah. Anybody? Okay, so what I'm gonna say is I, all the above because if you're fortunate enough, which happens like never, I think you to get somebody who's got 10 years experience, who's, I hate to say it, they don't have to be young, but they have to be young and young in the head, in the brain, and, and willing to learn and willing to adapt. You can find that person who's got skills, and you can you can tailor them to your specific needs. Um, that's very very. We do that, and we've done that, and we've had success with that on multiple occasions. And those all those employees still work for my company. Um, but training and education is key, and apprenticeship is key. Some people feel that having somebody newer uh, to the trade is is easier to train than somebody that's been trained on bad habits, if you will, over the years. Okay, well, yeah, there, that's true. There are people that have bad habits, and if you can't train that out of them, then they need to go quickly. Okay. But I will say this, Trask Bergerson put it this way. Trask also, my friend who owns Bergerson Tile on, outside of, in the coast of Oregon, he also has a slab fabrication shop, and he claims that he can take somebody brand new off the street and within about a year have them be a pretty darn good fabricator. 
But you take that same person and you run them through a title apprenticeship, and it's five years minimum before you can actually turn them loose. You know, and so... And why is that? That's because there's just so much variation in what a tile contractor has to do compared to one specific skill set in, in fabrication, right? Absolutely, man. We have, we have a, our trade is way more complex than, uh, than many people may realize. I mean, the amount of conditions we have, especially in high-end residential, we don't do the same. We aren't cranking out widgets, man. No two jobs are the same, ever. And so the amount of situations you're in are, it'd be one thing if we were just doing, you know, hotels and we have to do the same room a thousand times and then you but we don't ever have that you know, every piece is unique I mean it's just like art every bathroom we do is unique to itself and uh, even the time involved in layouts and stuff just burns through the hours yeah. so yeah, but, w once you get the employees there and I, I, uh, I, I you know what what is the role of you as a contractor in the training component I mean how active are you in providing training for your employees Individually, I, I have them go through NTCA University. We are big advocates of that. So we have the in-field instruction that's run by Trinity, our vice president at JNR Tile. He's huge into the training and education part. And we gauge that paralleled with and score that in-house to NTCA University and those modules as they go through them. And that's how we build our apprenticeship model. Um, at that pre-apprenticeship, that would be the greenhorn, right? Doesn't know anything. Uh, which we've had great success with because you're getting to train them from scratch. Uh, we had a pre-apprentice come in and his first two weeks all he did was work on a three-man team with Gage Porcelain. And I was like, oh my gosh, this kid knows more than most people in the country and he doesn't even know any better, right? But he didn't know any better, so he obtained the skill levels. Um, the retention part of that, I think, goes hand in hand when apprentices don't make that transition over to that installer or over to that journeyman when they can see that I'm moving through this apprenticeship and I have cost increases associated with it. I can see that I'm moving up within a company and there's, you know, the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel um, in terms of, of making it. We have all of our CTIs have headshots, right? So when you walk in our office, there's kind of the wall of fame and there's headshots of them on the wall. So we try to build that culture at the company where it's, I want to get my, I want to get my photo up on the wall. The most important part about apprenticeship, and I'm just going to say, and you touched on this, is that when somebody comes to work for you and they're learning the trade, they're, they actually see a path of ascension. They know where they're going. They can see, especially when you, once you get through your finishers courses, you start that, your three years of, of journeyman coursing, you, you know where you're going to end up. You know when your next raise is coming. You understand all those things. And um, as long as you're hitting those marks every six months, you're getting advancements in wage um, towards your journey. And minimum. they don't have to ask for it. That's the beauty of it. They're exactly. earning it at their own pace. They don't ever have to ask for it. Yeah, so do you all have like an ascension if once they pass a certain component of a skill set, you, they get a bump. They know that's there. Yeah, we have it on paper. It's, it's just like when they get hired and they start in the program, they see it. Though every year we do a wage survey within our, within our joint apprenticeship program. So those wages are, are, are they change. They go up every year incrementally. But, but, but the scale is exactly the same. That, that part doesn't change. And then offering people, offering health insurance and um, 401k. So you everything. offer benefits to yeah. your employees. Every, everything That's you one can. way to set you apart. Everything you can, because that way, this, isn't, this is a career, not a job. And that's really what it's about. Well, one of the, one of the things that we do is, is before the, or really the, uh, I call it interrogation. But we, uh, we have three questionnaires that we have for when we hire somebody. One is general health that doesn't know anything about tile. The second is an uh, uh, experienced helper, and the third one is a tile setter. So I have basically 20 questions, and some of them are psychological, some are you know, just life, what are your long-term goals, but I wanna know more about the person before I hire them. And you know, tile setter, you know, a guy will come in and say, I'm a tile setter, and we do all mud work still on, on walls and floors. And so they come in and say, I can, I can do mud. And before, I, before we had this, people would come in and bald face lie to you, get them on a job, and then take them out there, and they can't do anything, uh, or, they, or they had half the skill. This actually helps weed that part out. Um, and if, they, if they're honest with us and, and say, I don't know how to do those skills, you know, it, then, then we might take a harder look. But if they come in and bald face lie to us, it's like, 
I don't, I don't want you because that's going to be indicative of your attitude. We hire, I hire on attitude first. I can teach the skill, but I can't teach attitude. So it's really important for them to have a great attitude. And what, you know, get, go into these high schools and stuff like that. They're hiring these use younger guys. There are certainly challenges, but they have, they don't have the baggage. They don't have the baggage of, of having three kids and, you know, just be overburdened with, with, uh, having to pay for life. And when they've made, unfortunately, they've, they've made choice, choices in their life, but we want them to have a career. But, you know, it's, it's really tough to pay a guy when he's 30 years old, you know, what you start as an entry level job, um, you know, that's a lot of them that can't, can't do it, even though they qualify for it. So we're start, that's why we're starting with younger people. We, we onboard them when they come in, we spend half a day just for them, just look at basic stuff before we actually send them out to a job. Woody, I think your, your crews are very young. Can you, uh, did you, and, and don't you say that a lot of your employees help find your next employees? Talk about that a little bit. They do, and I, I think the reality is we probably all take the uh, shotgun approach to recruiting right now. And, and then, you know, something, you step back, let's step back, you know, August of last year, right? The, the, the construction market is overwhelmed. There's more work than any of us can get at. So we had to, we, we had to go out. We actually had a, an employee headhunted out of our organization and we had to go back and take a serious look and we just raised across the board. We, it, it, which I, it was calculated. You know, we, we, I, I'll give up this to keep good employees. It, it's it, so and that. You raised, you raised your compensation across the board. Across the board. Because it, we, we went in there and very quickly secured nobody wanted to touch our wage our wage so you were protecting anybody from hiring your people uh, right we won't even train honestly we we, we train in-house if you want to train us you come to us the only if when we go to ntca events we do not go our employees do not go without senior management being in place because people know us my helpers are most people setters so the, the, so we've got to watch this it's a recruitment because and they'll promise them and, and then you, you have to be communicating to your employees that okay that's not real they're they want to treat they want to pay you like a subcontractor treat you like an employee and have and so so your younger people don't know that yet right they don't understand they're 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 telling them they're really i'm going to treat you illegal i'm going to i'm going to set you up as a subcontractor, I need you to go get these fake policies, and, but, but I'll pay you $200 a day. I'm, I'm just throwing a number out there, of course, but, but, but my younger people actually do recruit for me more than anything. Well, that, that's one thing I don't allow is I don't allow any employee to go to tile warehouses because yep. what they do is they end up talking to somebody they know and then the guy's telling them they're making an unreasonable amount of money, that they're lying, and then they come back and it spreads like poison throughout your entire company. So I, I don't allow an employee to go pick up materials. You know, I, I'll, I'll do it way before I'll ever get them to do it just so that so I don't have to deal with that. We do too. I mean, that's the same thing. We actually stopped having employees. We actually stopped having employees go to the vent because everybody, you know, everybody knows our company and they become friends with everybody and they'll be there and they'll shoot the shit for whatever, you know, an hour and a half and everybody's going, you know, where'd you go? Not only that, um, there are signs being hung by our vendors. Uh, you know, we'll, we will pay $52 an hour of uh, full benefits, everything like that. You know, and so we have, we have a driver. We've had a driver for the, you know, for six or seven years now. And that really, it's actually improved efficiencies too. You don't want your people going to the, to, yeah, to the warehouse. Now I mean, they're not making you money while they're doing that. No, you know. So yeah, I, ag I agree with the same. I think it's very dangerous when they start that chatter at the at the uh, warehouse in the morning, and they all start talking about their lies. Yeah. 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 But but you know the 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 thing that you that I always fall back on is you remember the Great Recession and how you never missed your forty hour week during that Great Recession. And how loyal uh, Heritage Marble and Tile was to you? Just remember those days. Yeah, it's called it's it's called selective memory. Well, let me let me reverse that for a second. So so we unfortunately we're we're, we're blessed to have about three years of contracts right now sitting out in front of us. Okay, and, and there's obviously the challenges of the communication is price up and down this that and the other. That that's all right. We can work through that. What 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 happened to us is we were on a penthouse project in Atlanta. Unfortunately, a guy hits a 400 amp main. I won't get into all that. We be, all the subcontractors got kicked off the job. Not not because we're in trouble, because the, the building now has liability and they've got to figure out how they're going to fix it. So all of a sudden, I, I've got five crews sitting there for a hard March March to April 
because we're under a time of an essence contract in this particular project. And I don't have other work for them because that's the balance we kind of all take on, the, on this level is, is that I'm committing to your job. They're real well, good jobs for us. But on the other side of that, uh, I'm not going after other work. So they're, they're, and that's, I think that's how you have the relationships with your builders and that. But now I'm sitting here with, with nothing for five crews for four months. And so you start beating bushes and we're doing some things. I, you know, I, one of my employees said that that customer is like, you're Willy Wonka, that customer just got the golden ticket because you'd never take it for that price. So as owners, I, I'm taking a hit to keep them working. What we did though, is we brought all of them in there and said, this is exactly what's just happened. This is exactly what we're doing. We're very transparent and communicating to them. You're working because I'm taking a loss right now to keep you employed. So you're paying them even if they're not installing that. Exactly we, right. Those exactly right. So, but, but I think you, we, we sometimes internalize that and we don't trust our employees to communicate that. You know, and we're just very, uh, we're very communicative to them. This is what you're seeing. This is why some of you are doing some odd things right now. Um, here's where we're at in the situation. Here's where we see things are happening. Um, we're taking some jobs that you probably normally wouldn't be working on because it's just making your wages for you. Dan, I think you might be the only one that mentioned you do do sub some subcontracting. Do you, you do sub some work work out when you're doing a, yeah, a large do. project? Uh, what do you look at? What, you know, what's that process? Finding a sub that you could put your Lambert Tiles name behind? Well, we have a, a pretty good list of certified tile installers that we use, and so that's that's the main thing that we look for is the proficiency with standards. And you know, if somebody doesn't even own a ten foot straight edge, uh, they probably don't know what the floor flatness standards are. So yeah, we look for, for qualified labor first and, uh, and then we vet people, um, even if they are, you know, kind of veteran installers, uh, just to, you know, see if they actually are familiar with the, the standards and methods of the industry. And uh, do all of you utilize the CTI, do cert, cert, make sure that you have certified installers? And I think you do. And uh, um, how does, do they get a bump once they pass those certifications? What's your role there? I have more certified installers than anybody in the Southeast, I think, probably. I'm, I'm, I absolutely 100% believe in that program. Um, not only do they get it, we, we, we said this is what we want and we build to that because that's the jump off point for us with CTI certification. Um, we do something special. Everybody has different, we're, we're wood level people because we pull a lot of mud, so crick levels are have a meaning to us. Um, when they pass, they get a full set and we scribe their levels with their CTI number. That's something we do. Um, as ACTs have come around, um, it's getting harder and harder to find bigger levels for them, but we're, we're doing it. And, and uh, um, so we, we um, uh, and not only is it a bump in pay, it's the beginning of the, so that, I, I, think, I think what Dirk's saying, right? If, what are you building to? Here's the career we're offering you and here's a real big milestone we want you to hit. Um, you mentioned earlier we have this NTCA University. It's uh, every member gets it, access to it uh, to fr you know, free, but it's it's got a four-year apprenticeship program uh, on it that was approved by the guidelines approved by the Department of Labor. Doesn't mean you have to uh, implement a full apprenticeship program. You can use our our NTCA University for just spot training or incremental training. Dirk, tell them a little bit about what you've done with apprenticeship in Portland. It's kind of unique, and it might be something that some mid-sized or smaller contractors might want to consider in their own community because you partnered with some other people because you really couldn't launch apprenticeship all by yourself. So yeah, it's a monstrous animal to take down. On paper, it seems like something that should. Oh yeah, this we could we could we could make this happen. We for for a number of years we were utilizing the Northwest College of Construction. They had a uh, tile program that utilized the NTCA guidelines and um, but it was freaking expensive. And, and by the time we, we had three, we graduated a couple people, then we had three more guys in there, and then nobody else had, um, and nobody else had people in the program. And they came to us, the president of the college came to us and said, you know, we don't have quorum, we have to raise your prices to this. And I was like, gee, many Christmas, we, we can't afford it. And I thought that we weren't really gonna be able to do it. And one of the employees who had left to, the College of Construction went to ABC, which is Allied Builders and Contractors, and they basically administrate apprenticeship programs is what they do. And so um, she came to us as Galsera and said, I think you guys can do it yourselves, but I think what you need to do is see if you want to get uh, a number of other companies involved. So I basically 
put it out there. We contacted, at the time, Sean Parker, who was working for me, and Ryan Willoughby, and myself. We put it out there to every contractor we knew, and we had a meeting at Hawthorne Tile. Um, I think we had, I don't know, 15, 16 companies showed up at the meeting. Um, by the time we, you know, the dust settled, we ended up with uh, 10 companies that were in it. Currently, we have eight companies that sit on our board, um, and we utilize the NTCA University. Um, it's easy to put together a first-year class, right? Okay, your, your, your first-year class is easy, but then the next year you got to put together a second-year class. Then you have to put together a third-year class, and, you have to f and then you have to put together a finishers course. So, so you we have each have your own employee in there. Is that yeah? Or so employees. Every, everybody, not everybody at the same time has employees. You know, on the, sits on our board have employees in okay. it, but we we basically work together to um, to basically teach the course, at least the first year courses, and then we had to then we hired a second year uh, person to teach the second year courses, and then by the time we had a third year course, we had to figure out how we're going to do. It. Anyway, it's it's a lot. I mean, man, I it sometimes I I'm like, God, my God, I can't believe we're still doing this because it's just it's it is a lot of work. It is a unique model, that's for sure. Yeah, and, but it, but it works, and everybody everybody does their part, yeah. and we've been we've. We've had so many. I mean, the industry has been so great to us, and we we get donations from from everybody in our industry. I mean, graciously. Not only that, we get a donation of the of our the warehouse space we utilize for our um, for our classes, where we can keep our modules set up. Um, like I said, it's a, it's 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 a gracious industry, and everybody wants us to succeed. Yeah. Aaron, you're uh, uh, a five star contractor on the commercial side down there in Texas. Uh, what um, you know, what have you done? You know, I think you've had some success in really um, taking the qualifications of your company, certified installers, the five-star accreditation, or rec company recognition, which is in specifications. So um, what have you done with those credentials in order to secure work? I think you're having some success. Maybe you can share a little bit about that. We are. Our team has found that, you know, of the 65 NCCA five-star contractors were able to give continuing education units similar to what we're, we're doing right now to the designers and architectural community um, in that San Antonio area. So, you know, using some data and of course the plans that we review commercially often for the types of high-end commercial projects that, that we get into, um, we do lunch and learns. Really simple, one hour lunches, right? They don't have to stay after work they get a free lunch, get their credit, and um, part of that is teaching them that language of, of qualified labor, and almost every architect that we've done a lunch and learn with, and I, I think there's 10 or 11 different topics, we'll let them actually pick which one they'd like to focus on. We get those um, qualified lab labor specifications, we see them appear over and over again after giving the presentation to the architectural firms. So that's uh, what we've seen on, on quite a bit of what we've been awarded on the five-star specs. At the same time, you have to be proactive in getting out there and really building those relationships and making sure that you talk to Amber Fox as our, our five-star coordinator, having them reach out before that bid deadline um, to make them aware, hey, here are the five-stars in your area. So we have somebody on the national level. It, you know, sticks to the ribs a little better and, and really shows that notoriety to the, the architect and the general contractor. What about, we talked about where we, you know, what we're worried about being one year from now, you know, all of you uh, are, are uh, business owners, you know, what, what, what about five-year planning? I mean, does it, you know, at NTCA, we're always trying to update a two-year strategic plan. What, how do you guys approach strategic planning um, and you know, I don't know if, if you've ever sold or thought of selling your business, or, and, and if you would, would you, would you consider selling it to your employees, or would you be looking for the next, a pretty good <laughs> offer right now? Let's talk about five-year strategic well, plan. I, I think some of us can cross that 10-year off the, yeah. on, the yeah. on this. So. <laughs> Me so and you, I'm, for I'm sure. Not, yeah, we're I'm, one day apart, right? <laughs> yeah. well, both uh, myself and Bart turned 60 this year, and we're a day apart, so uh, that 10 years off the, off the chart for me, so well, I'm then, looking then more that three means, to five. That, that means you should be thinking about this now. So what, it, what are you thinking? I've actually, you know, like, again, being part of NTCA and being around people who've done this and being able to talk to them has really opened it up. I'm, I do have a plan, and I do think the plan has uh, a chance of working. 
And I've been working on that with one of my key employees who's been with me uh, since almost the beginning. And, uh, and so I'm putting things in place and easing him in, probably a three to five year transition period would actually help me transfer the business over rather than it just go away and it just disappear. Because we've put too much hard work in. I've worked hard to get the business where it is today. And it's easy for someone to start their own business, but they've got to start from zero. And I keep explaining that. It's like the name uh, recognition and all the work and the quality that goes with that has value. And there's no need to start from zero. You can actually transition into this business and have a turnkey business that will work for you and will be your retirement and uh, be able to pass it on. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, one of, one of the advantages I have, I've, of course, I've, this is my 47th year in tile. And uh, my son joined the company three years ago. And it's been, it's been a great experience in him coming to these things, absorbing as much as he can. We were, we were in the uh, room just BSing with three or four other uh, five-star. And, you know, he, he didn't say a word, but all he did was absorb it. So it's, it's, it's been really cool for him to be involved and be a part of it. You know, my wife says, when are you going to retire? And I said, never. They're going to plant, they're going to bury me in my truck, just drive it on into a hole. Um, but, you know, you know, at, at any point I could get abducted by aliens and then I that think way you already were, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's a good feeling knowing that, uh, that he's, he, he hopefully will be able to, and he, and I'm giving him a, as much information as I think that he can absorb at one time instead of delusion him. But it's, think, it's yeah. fun, to, fun to, to have somebody, my family behind me. Yeah, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, family owned businesses where, Succession planning through your children is definitely a part of it. What do you had something you want no, to say? No, I'm a, a little different. So on a on a very personal level, I have a, a private book that nobody sees. Um, there's a, there's a three, a five, and a ten, and and they're probably more um, abstract thoughts. That and then there and then there, and then as, as it gets into the five, it becomes goals. So I'm I'm right now there's goals of new product groups I'm looking at that we can get into as, as a company. Um, and, and, I'm, and now it becomes not just me, um, it becomes, I, 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 we're working on a succession plan and it, and it goes back to, okay, now I'm a businessman, but I don't know how to do this. So we've hired a consulting group to help us navigate that. Um, but, and then I have to have, you have to have these really hard conversations because one of the, there, there she is. There's one of the people I've groomed up, you know, Janice, and helping helping us. And she's in, and we've gotten her involved in NTCA, right? So we're to carry on this legacy as well um, because we believe in, in this. Um, uh, I think what what we're looking at is you have to be able to have these very hard, honest conversations as to what you want and what do they want because. Because ultimately, you're saying this may be my vision, but it isn't my vision anymore. Exactly. Yeah. What has anybody had their contracting business valued, and what what goes into that? I'm curious because when you know when I was in distribution, you know that made sense. You had your inventory, you had your buildings, you you know you you, you know you had people, but you, if you were going to sell that business, you didn't guarantee that the people would stay. But you knew you had inventory, you knew you had a building, and you had and you weren't going to guarantee that those product lines would stay. So that all factored into your valuation. How about a contracting company? Yeah, absolutely. But here's the difference: like there's no blue sky anymore. Right. So, in, for instance, uh, it used to be your customer list would have part of evaluation. Doesn't work at all. It, it means nothing anymore. Matter of fact, a a what they call um, um, bath in the day. There's there's a word um, uh, bath in the day. P, companies contracting company replacement contractors is what they call them. It, those guys who have lead generation programs and that are very valuable. For most of us, it's about relationships and contractor and that so that so the valuation doesn't look that way so they start to look we look at you know what our assets are and assets aren't trucks those are depreciating and that they're, they're, they look at a lot of those the, those numbers so that that's where that consulting what about your contracts are they part of an asset they are I, I just purchased the company from my parents in November and we had to do evaluation and that was you know a big part of it was was backlog and of course depreciated assets the building things of that nature right. but I was shocked when I learned you know your website traffic and like lead generation what a huge role that played in the valuation process you know and and our plan for growth and moving forward knowing that's something that needs to really be implemented 
for a, a high valuation later if perhaps it's going to be sold because I don't have a Cody, right? Hopefully my dorky little nephew will want to take this over one day, but it's not looking good so far with the video games, you know? <laughs> So nobody's looking to sell their business anytime soon, huh? Well, I tell you, I had, in, in, on, a, on a kind of a funny side note, I, I got a call a few months back, and, and obviously it was this guy calls and says, hey, Dirk, uh, this is uh, so-and-so with so-and-so, and we represent buyers who would like to buy companies just like yours. And I was like, okay, I'm thinking of a number. You can come and get the keys. You know, it, it, and he goes, oh, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. But, but you know, <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, you, I thought you were representing buyers that want to buy businesses just like mine. But I think that the, the thing is, is that um, you know, we're looking at, we're talking about different ways to go about it. I'm still not sure how I want to go about it. I'm not sure what that looks like. You know, we're looking at a 10-year plan. Um, I, I, you know, I know at this point, my, neither one of my kids are interested in it because they have other goals and aspirations. Um, so, you know, but it's a, it's a conversation that we're having internally. Right. And, and the, the beauty is, I love what I do. I mean, every, every day, it's, I don't go to work. I, I enjoy what I do every single day. We're, and we're in the relationship business, you know, with a high-skilled high trade. That's what makes it so fun, you know, and, and, and that's the reason why I plan on really never retiring. I'll probably pull back some, uh, but, but I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. That's great. Uh, we've got just a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I'm sh I should have been looking. I'm so sorry. Uh, go ahead. You over there. Yes. It's actually a great topic because, you know, we're... Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there are certain, you know... By, by the way, that's, uh, that's Jay Fisher, who was uh, an NTCA president yes, back in the day, I, who is a very respected uh, California, fellow California uh, company, who's family owned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a long time ago, Jay. I'm going to argue on that one. <laughs> but that's an actually interesting topic because I was hearing people in our booth talk about actually getting specs now or to being told that the product was coming from Amazon and, 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 and other suppliers. I, uh, Martin, uh, you went through something on this. I actually posted uh, just recently. It made my bl blood boil. I just dealt with an, an, uh, an online uh, retailer who wants to take my money up front and offers nothing but poor service once they've got my money. And it really made me angry, but unfortunately there are many out there right now who have gone to e-commerce that is not beneficial to a tile contractor. And it just worries me that the industry will go in that direction. And they don't understand our side of the industry. They only understand sales and marketing and how to take money. And I've tried to have conversations with them about this, but they just don't want to engage. And it really is sad that it's come to this because we have to perfect the product they supply and it's very difficult when they're not part of the conversation. Yeah, I know, Bill, you had your hand up, but, you know, that is an interesting th thing we're talking about. I'm just curious. Woody touched on it earlier about not marking a product. You know, back when I was in distribution, the contractors that I worked with, everyone had, they bought the materials and they had a, mark, a markup to cover their overhead. You're going to have to, pro we are having to be proactive to address that because the way people are getting tile now is changing. Floor and decor has changed that business model a little bit. And others, you know, Home Depot you know, and, and home centers, and now the internet. So I think, Woody, your point about really 
focusing on uh, what are your costs and what, you know, you've got to factor in the gas, your guys, the crews, all of that and incorporate that into your labor bed, right? Well, we're putting, so, so think about it, we, we were, you would mark up Tyler Cup certain overhead costs and that. What we've done is said, here, we'll, we'll show you transparently whatever you're paying for, but what we've done is put straight line items as this is what it costs to land in my warehouse, this is what it costs for me to go around and pick it up and put it there. We're, we're putting staging those kind of, la we're showing them as labor line items. Because, and then when somebody says anything, okay, hold on, you, I've estimated a service of installation. I didn't estimate a logistic service. I've never advertised me to be a logistic service, so we just say this is logistic cost in our general condition. But, well, but they're true costs. They're true costs. You and, have to get well, the and, Well, honestly, we're making money at it. We're not, we're not you know. I'm, yeah, in residential, a lot of people, I've had this conversation with designers, saying, okay, we, with this, we chose this tile, and even manufacture, tile manufacturers, Go pick it up and then bring it to the job. And it's like, okay, uh, am I going to get paid for doing that? You know, since we're not we're not actually purchasing, they're expecting us to deliver. And it's like, you know, I've, I've got a handling and delivery charge. Well, just add it to your installation. It's like, no, that's not where it belongs. Installation is installation. Picking it up and taking it to your job. If you want to buy the tile thinking you're going to make, I mean, we don't make a lot of money on tile. If you want to pick it up and take it to the job, you stage it in the area we're going to stage it. You know, and have it ready when we get there. Uh, if you want to get, if you want to assume that liability, go for it. Just to go back on that, how am I protecting myself for future price escalation? But um, I, a lot of my uh, jobs that come through from an architect, they don't have a designer or a specifier for the tile elevations yet. And I always used to push them, uh, and uh, I'd put an allowance in there, and I'd push to get a finished schedule so I could lock it all in. I am not pushing right now. I will actually leave it as long as I can and leave that allowance number in there so I can legitimately change it further down the road. Yeah. Bill, you had a question. I, I, we're, gonna, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure you got that in. even talk about what that did to, to us. I, I got, I got like three uh, voicemails, Bill, I'm going to forward to you so you can take the call and you can call them back this afternoon if you don't mind. <laughs> but that's a great way, that's a great question to end on with, with uh, all of us is uh, what, what has the impact of the other tra your trades had on your scheduling and how do you guys address that? That's a great question. Well, well some, of the, some of the, a lot of the trades that are before us have gotten sloppier and sloppier and sloppier. You know, we've had to spend a lot more time cleaning, trying to educate a contra uh, building contractor. That wasn't part of our bid. And, you know, trying to, to read specs, it's almost like they have amnesia if you show them the TCNA handbook that this is not part of our job. And we didn't bid part of that job. But the, the trades are, like I said, are getting sloppier, and it, and it makes it really tough trying to figure out who's going to pay for that. You can't rush quality. you got to wait. Process. And commerci commercially, contractually, you send them a notice for delay and disruption. Yeah, you, you've got. And I would think residentially, you know, depending on. So what's the real world the been like? What's been the real world? It's terrible. Yeah. I mean, we had to send three crews home for four days, which, of course, we were make we're going to make sure they were making forty-hour weeks. You can't lose your staff because of a COVID shutdown from another trade. Not but to mention they were already behind, and the whole schedule was behind. So we're now, you know. So I get that. And currently running different projects and having to, you know, the things we all do every day. And I get that you have that contract and uh, that, but what about the trickle-down effect that puts on your business for your next job or your next schedule? That's the whole problem, that mobilizing uh, a crew when you come back and now you're short manpower on your current job because you, had to, you have to mobilize to the next one because yeah. this one's behind. So now you're causing a delay according to the GC, you know. All right, one last question or comment, and then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah.
Great question. Who wants to take that one on? Keep coming to, the th to these type of sessions, networking with, with uh, other contractors. That's, that's the best way of life. I would think some of that responsibility is on the business owners to make sure you get those opportunities and, and, and that they right. provide that opportunity for you, not just on the technical side. And I, I've actually reached out on like tile money and NTCA about mentoring. We have a mentoring program, but uh, people feel reluctant to reach out. I don't know whether they're intimidated or what, but it's very difficult to get people who are starting in business to reach out. I, I would say this, you know, it being Hear, hear your peers, right? I mean, we, we, we stay in each other's pocket like, you know, we're talking. We're, we're always talking. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a very big asset of an association. But Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, I was going to say, Cody, that, that you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time, but you're, you know, my involvement in the NTCA, there's a, the, the success of my business is, is a, you know, there's a direct correlation between that and my involvement in the NTCA, and that's all I can tell you, man. It's just, it's just ask questions, hang out with with the good guys, um, and ask questions, and ask more questions, and know the, who you can call anytime you want. Because and you're doing it right because you're here right now. Exactly. Yeah. And, and my best yeah. advice to anybody that's young in our industry on the contracting side is knowledge is power, right? Yes. So the more you learn technically. Uh, uh, in the beginning and learn, you know, learn how to install and learn the whole technical components that that can bleed it. The more you know about that component of your business, then you can start to actually start focusing on, you know, the business side, the estimating side, uh, uh, the sales side, you know, so much, a lot of times we don't talk about sales, how important relationships are and, and, and that, but, you know, we can certainly try to provide those opportunities for you. I, I can remember, I've been an uh, NTCA member since 1985 and I can remember coming to my first coverings just be intimidated as heck because walking in and seeing the the, the knowledge the the I won't call it power but but just seeing the people in the room and it was surprising just asking questions and doing more listening just sitting there listen to them talk and then you know one thing led to, to the next step and then the next step and then my you know getting involved with the association and again the, the information, the wealth of information that, that's available is just taking advantage. I can't tell you how many, how many beers we've drank just talking about tile till late in the morning uh, of sharing stories and, and also sharing knowledge. It's great. Let, let's not forget uh, Total Solutions Plus, which really gets you and gives you a deep dive into business too with the, with the, the, the yeah, seminars. Yeah, never heard of Total Solutions there. Plus. It's a, a management leadership conference put on by the NTCA and also the Tile Distributors Association uh, and the uh, uh, Union Tile Contractors Association and the Tile Council of North America. It's an excellent, excellent uh, fall event. Would highly recommend it. We're over time, but I want to th please give a hand to uh, our, our panelists, uh, really, and want to thank you all for coming and hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and uh, hope you visit NTCA in our booth. Thank you again. Appreciate it.